Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the RISE initiative, it is an acronym. It is an abbreviation for respect, I'm sorry, reflect, intervene, speak, and engage. It is, I think, a calling for everyone on this campus to aspire to um, the obligations, the complexity, and the opportunities that exist when you look at the richness of diversity as it is expressed on our campus. Um, we define diversity in the broadest of terms. We all come to this campus with different identities, different meanings, different outlooks. Um, we have different spiritualities, different gender perspectives, different sexualities, different races, religions, um, abilities, and all of that contributes to the rich diversity that is our campus. And through the RISE initiative, we are actively seeking to provide opportunities throughout your experience here as students, as faculty, as staff, to really engage in discussion and growth and reflection on the complexity of diversity and how we live it, believe in it, aspire for it, at the University of Chicago. Um, this is a newer initiative on this campus. It is highly aspirational, and I welcome you to yet another one of our conversations here on campus. We do have a few of the RISE Committee members present. The RISE Committee is formed with faculty, staff, students, and alumni at the University of Chicago, and if they would just stand for just a second and say hi, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I don't know if you've walked across the campus as many times as I have this week. It has been a little wet and dreary. Um, but you'll notice, I think, one of the best expressions of student initiative on this campus. Um, Vincente is one of our students in the college. And because of his initiative, because of his own aspiration, um, he launched an initiative that was called Identity Week um, and that is living on our campus through the visual display that you've seen on the main quad, where Vincente and, his, uh, and the students who have been working with him have really challenged everyone on this campus to define and stand for their own identity and what they offer to this campus. And so it is my great privilege to introduce you to Vincente, who will tell you more about our speaker. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on this podium for two reasons. One, because I'm super short. Uh, the other reason, because I'm not as quick on my feet and I have a sheet of paper here. So I was given the wonderful privilege of um, welcoming our speaker tonight, Ron Suskin. Just to give you a little bit of background about Ron Suskin. Ron Suskin is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, has written some of America's most important works of nonfiction, framing national debates while exploring the complexities of human experience. His first book, A Hope in the Unseen, An American Odyssey from the Inner City to the Ivy League, Ron Suskin exposed the barriers to accessing higher education super relevant given our setting right now. The biographical novel highlighted issues of race, gender, and class, just as the conversations about college access was gaining momentum. Suskin will further that conversation in his lecture, which is part of the RISE series, detailing how personal narratives motivate social change. Uh, I'm kind of a person for pers personal narratives too, so I'm really excited to hear this speech. Suskin is also the author of a number of other books, including Confidence Men, Wall Street, Washington and Education of a President, The Way of the World, a story of truth and hope in an age of extremism, and his most recent book, Life Animated. In addition to his books, he often appears on network television and has been a contributor to the New York Times Magazine and Esquire. Mr. Suskin was the Wall Street Journal's senior national affairs reporter from 1993 until his departure in 2000, and won the 1995 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. He currently lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his wife, Cornelia Kennedy, and is the senior fellow at Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. Please join us right now in welcoming Ron Suskin, our RISE Kevlar, Kevlar Fellow and speaker for today's lecture. I'm good, thanks. No, I'm good, I think you just put it up there. Hi, uh, okay, this will be fun. I'm not getting behind this podium, because I would, Vicente, you could eat apples off my head. I would vanish behind this thing. Um, and this will be nice. OK, I got a nice aisle here. We can, this will be like Oprah. We'll hug and cry and come up with solutions. Um, all right, so uh, how, uh, Ellie, how long, do you, how long do we have to go? We, um, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, OK. And Q&A within that or after that? OK, so I'm going to talk for a while, and then we're going to mix it up. Um, and that's going to be the good part. You're an informed set of questioners. I learn more from you than you can from me. Um, so let me, uh, let me tell a little weave of stories that I think uh, will yield uh, hopefully some uh, light, maybe this heat, but I think a little light, 
um, on all these issues. Certainly the key issues of diversity are at the center. And I'm going to, um, though I write about people from all over the world, I've written, this is my sixth book now, and I've traveled all over the globe, Pakistan, Afghanistan, obviously urban America, uh, finding characters. Uh, in this last book, Life Animated, uh, I end up being a character myself, as is my family, which is a harrowing uh, prospect, um, but it worked out. You know, for years I've been telling sources, trust truth, just tell me everything. And often they have. Uh, I have so much sympathy for them now having him to turn those hot lights on myself, my wife, my kids. Um, well, let me start by saying that I arrive uh, at an age where I can begin learning. Um, I think uh, much like the lives most people or many people live, certainly many of the people I went to college with, I'm old, so I went from 77 to 81. And, uh, you know, when... Vincenti reads that, that bio, you know, what rings in my head is a voice. It's a voice from Brooklyn. It's a woman, she's about this tall. It's my mother. And uh, she says, you know, fine, but she wanted more from me than this. This is, they're not, you know, she wanted me to be a professional, you know. <laughs> and basically she says, you know, Look, uh, early on she described to me the way it works. She says, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. I just won't mention your name to other people, just so you know. <laughs> it's a motivational methodology that is widely and well known. The motivational power of conditional affection. Look, she knows it's a tough world out there. She wanted me to have armament every accolade I could grab, every bell I could ring. Because, you know, you'll need them. You'll need to, to carry that armament with you in the struggles, in the game of musical chairs up ahead. Because you want to make sure you get a chair. This is the world she came from, Depression era. Now, I, I did what my mother taught me and push forward furiously to get every one of those laurels I could grab. I had the added condition that my father died when I was a kid, and on his deathbed he wrote a letter to me and my brother about living the worthwhile life. Now, me and my mother had some disagreements on some of these issues, because he says in this letter, he says, one thing I'll ask of you, Life is precious. Time is precious. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Something you can be proud of as a thing of worth every day. The rest will take care of itself. My mother vigorously disagrees with this philosophy. She says, do something that's going to get you something. Figure out what the transactional arrangements are out there and win whatever those competitions are. So when I get to an age of ownership of these things. I'm working at the Wall Street Journal. It's the fall of 1993. At that point, I got kind of a golden ticket. I was at the Journal's Boston Bureau, and I got a job in Washington as the senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal. I mean, this was a terrific job. I mean, you know, I had to kill 10 guys to get this job. Nice family men, very lovely guys. And I got it. I'm going to Washington, young family. My wife's a journalist too, but at this point I got two boys. My youngest son is just shy of three. My oldest son's five, and we're on the move. We're reaching for it. Individualism. Right there. Got it. We get to Washington, unpacking boxes, rented house in Georgetown, new bureau, Washington Bureau of the Wall Street Journal, biggest newspaper in the country. I'm going to be writing for the front page. Time of great excitement. We notice something, though. Something's wrong with our little guy. I don't know, he seems very upset. He's very chatty, happy. 
at two and a half. You know, I love you, let's get ice cream, engaging, little jokes even. But he seems unsettled. Then worse, he's not talking. And that two and a half year old speech, a couple hundred words, three months later, is down to one word, juice. Uno. He's lost all speech. It's another month or two that we meet a doctor who says the word autism. It's not a word we were familiar with. You know, we'd seen Rain Man. It's all most people knew. Dustin Hoffman playing that character. Then the doctor explained, well, it's called regressive autism. It's about a third of the cases. It's like other kids are autistic, but he may never get his speech back. A lot of them don't. And um, so you've got to be thinking differently now. You're on a life journey. And one of the doctors we saw says, so what is it you do for a living? I said, I'm a newspaper reporter. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He did not know my mother, by the way. <laughs> there was no relationship there. But he was speaking, in a way, in her voice. He's like, what, you're 33? You, you're good with numbers? You know, mitts and mitts. Thought about investment banking. That's a nice career. Private equity. Like, uh, this is kind of what I have to do. I tell stories, and that's my career. So you knew what was ahead. Having to think about supporting your kid for the next 50 years and 30 years after you're dead. But off we went. Changes were afoot. Things we couldn't predict. Now mind you, I arrive at this place, having killed those 10 guys for that job, full of all of the professional bullions of a winner of the meritocracy. I went to fine schools. I got a graduate degree from Columbia. Hell, I even taught at Harvard. God, my mother was so happy when I told her that. It was joy. But all of a sudden, our life was a mess. You know, it's easy to embrace omniscience, that smugness and certainty, that because of all those accolades, my genes are beautifully recombined. Let me just look at me. Did I tell you what school I went to? Yeah, sure, Chicago. Well, of course. Until all of a sudden, everything's upside down. It's easy to be smug when your life's nice and neat. All of a sudden, it's not. You're a mess. You're thinking about that kid. What does his life look like? I'm starting to get into the guts. What often creates so much trouble in our conversations about this diversity, about tribe, about parents wanting the kids to prove they've selected those parents so well, about who's the victor? What does it mean? How do we establish and measure worth transactionally in this society? What is his life going to be like? You know, if, if he can feel the sun in his face and not be uncomfortable, that's a victory. Is that a life of worth? He doesn't measure on tests. He'll never be able to measure anything he does. That's where we are. Now, of course, I've got to go out and do more than a traditional journalist. I have to be not just good, I've got to be very good. I've got to be better than very good. And I'm thinking too much about that, but I do go on my first big assignment to the worst high school I can find in America. It happens to be cross town in Washington, D.C. It's called Frank Ballou Senior High School. It's way, way up Martin Luther King Boulevard. Most cities have one of those. I live in the Fertile Crescent of Northwest Washington. Anyone here been to D.C.? Yeah, right, you know. It's up where the lawyers and the lobbyists, and especially the lobbyists live. Most of the journalists, they can't afford that part of town, but that's where we live, a little crescent. Almost two-thirds, pushing three-quarters of Washington's African-American, and some of them 
in tough circumstances, and they live in the other parts of town. So I'm crossing the border to find this worst high school I can find. Why? Well, what prompts it? The buddy of mine comes back from Bosnia. That was the big battle in that period, the big tribal conflict that roiled a big part of the globe. He had written a story about children embracing hope where there was no reason to hope, about Serb and Croats slaughtering each other. Because who is the right one? They look just alike to me, not to them. Choose your sides. And that was a great story he wrote, and we were college roommates. He went to Columbia with me, and I'm like, that was a great story about those kids when the bullet's flying and what they're able to summon in the way of hope. Now, we're competitive. We're guys. So I said, you know, actually, across town in our town of Washington, well, it's a little like what it takes to learn in a war zone environment cross town with the bullets flying. It's like a kid in Bosnia finding a calculus book in the street and learning calculus. If we found a kid like that in Bosnia, we'd roll a red carpet from Harvard to the former Yugoslavia to get him, right? But inner city African American, Latino American kid from the so called other America, as Michael Harrington calls it. Well, we said, we have this thing, it's called the meritocracy. Here's a test. Here you go. Got a pencil? Yeah, ovals. <laughs> ovals. Why is that? Yeah, sorry, nothing I can do for you. You got a score for me? Yeah, sorry. What's that about? Owen, my son, had altered me. I was beginning to learn, to see with what Proust would call new eyes. You know the line, it's one of the classics. The voyage of discovery, Proust says, is not about seeking new landscapes. It's about having new eyes. How do you get new eyes? You got to earn them. So I go across town to this worst high school I can find. Because, as I say to the principal, you know, I think it's a feat to learn in this war zone environment. I want to talk to your best students. Because I, I, I want to show this, I want to understand it. Frank Blue High School. So, uh, about a third of the kids don't come to school most days. That's one of the numbers they keep judiciously. 500 kids, 80 have a B average or better. I mean, they have great inflation at Harvard, but not at Blue. Ten security guards are in the halls every day and three uniformed cops. There was a murder recently in the hallways. There are many incidents in and around the school. And I'm there with a big neon sign. You know the sign. White guy, no clue. Blinking, bing, bing, bing. All the kids see me. Oh, boy. I go to the principal. I say, I want to write a story for the Wall Street Journal. Hmm. Yeah, I know. The superintendent told me I got to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. I'm doing this under duress, that's guy. That's what I mean. The 82 kids. Yeah, 82 kids, right? You see them in this little cinder block room next to my office. You do not leave that office. It's got a list of them. They come in one at a time. First kid, the kid, Lawrence Abbott. We start the conversation. Across a deep divide, no less now, maybe a little, not much. Us and them, race and class. Is it so Lawrence, you got a B plus average? Uh huh. Got many friends? Nuh uh. You want to go to college? Uh huh. We good? Uh huh. Bye. Could be shouting across a chasm. He's sizing me up. I know him, lumpy, middle-aged Jewish guy from the suburbs. What's he want to do with me? This goes all the way up <laughs> to the M's. It's about a week. And one of the kids, after about 20 minutes of monosyllables, says, what are you here, to be my savior? 
And I, I said, um, um, Jewish, we, we don't do saviors. And this is the only laugh I get in a week. That's how bad it's going. Then I walk out into the office. The principal's waiting for me. How's it going? Yeah, not good. Yeah, I could have told you I'm going to go good. Is it? But, you know, you, you wouldn't have taken it from me, right? Because, you know, I didn't go to one of those fine universities that you respect, right? Am I right? Whatever. Let me explain it now. In this place... Scholarship is no honor. Not here. It's an upside down world. Right? You know, my best students, here, they hide. You know, because they understand that getting those A's sometimes singles them out. We call them undercover honor students. We call it the crab bucket syndrome. That's the way it actually works. One crab's trying to pull out of the bucket, the other one's pulling him down. I got kids here at 16 who can't imagine what 19 looks like. In this part of Washington, D.C., 71% of the men between 18 and 36 are in the system. Criminal justice in some fashion. Either in prison, in jail, on parole, on probation. Undercover honesty. That's right, you're going to out them. You're going to uncover them. I said, I'm the, I'm the worst nightmare. That's right, you're the worst nightmare. As we're having this discussion, a kid walks in and kind of bumps me as he walks by. He doesn't even really look at me. He looks at the principal, Richard Washington. He says, my computer science teacher is a problem with me as a person, not my work. I deserve an A+. Plus. He's giving me an A-. minus. I'm fighting this grade. I got my tests. I got my quizzes. I'll be back. He walks out. I'm like, who's that? That's Cedric Jennings, but stay away from him. He's nothing but trouble. I said, Jennings, uh, he wasn't in the Jays. No, I took him off the list. Really? Well, as my parting gift, before I have to go back to my side of town, could you tell me why? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, you know, straight A's, junior, probably our valedictorian, salutatorian, certainly. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Uh, he wears those A's like a shining breastplate pushing them in kids' faces. You know, I've got, I've got boys here who are like walking around like ticking bombs. We have fights in the hall. Kids are on him. He's pushing back. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. He's got a quick tongue, and he's too damn proud is his problem. I said, too proud. That's right. I said, oh, uh, where is he now? Well, it's 2 o'clock. He's up in chemistry. So look, I got to drive a pretty good drive down Martin Luther King over to, to Northwest, and could I just get a pass to go to the, the, the men's, the, the boys' room? Yeah, he gives me a hall pass. <laughs> he rude that day for many years to come. So I go to the bathroom, and in the bathroom, actually, I meet a key player in this school, a guy named Delante Coleman. Now, Delante knew exactly who I was when I walked in the door, because his, his gang told him. He runs the biggest gang at the school. Right? He runs his global operations out of the boys' room. And it's significant. And I checked him out with the police. He's a player. He's a player in the school. He's a player in the projects. He's a player in these streets. He's got 20 guys who will do anything he says. He makes more money than my brother, who works at Morgan Stanley. He's got two cars. He says, I'm going to get it my own way. Significant skills are expressed in what he does. Make no mistake. But he's a little guy like me. And I'm interested in talking to him. I got my shot. I say, you know who I, I know who you are. You're the Wall Street Journal report. I knew who you were five minutes when you got in the building. I said, well, let's establish ground rules first, okay? First off, uh, I'm a grown-up, and you are still a kid. This was a risky move. But I have a friend who some of you know here, old buddy named Alex Kotlowitz. Anyone know Alex here? He wrote a great book called There Are No Children Here. He's been a longtime co-conspirator and inspiration. Kids at the, uh, the Henry Horner houses and about how quickly people 
in those kinds of toxic environments have to grow up. So I want to establish ground rules with Delante. You know, people want to be children when they're children. So it's like, okay. So it's okay, fine. We have our ground rules established. I have a question for you. How'd you get to be the head of this biggest gang? You're like a little guy like me. It's kind of a surprise. He's like, huh. Okay, let, let me explain. Um, you see, the guy who used to run the gang named Angela Magruder, he was a big guy. He was about 6'8", 300 pounds. Now, I was like his number two, okay? Now, he got whacked, and the guy who whacked him got some get back. That means he got whacked. And, uh, and, the, and, uh, and he pauses. Now, uh, the perception was I was behind that. And all I really need is the perception, okay? Now, any of you take philosophy here? Philosophy class? Any read Machiavelli's The Prince? In the paperback edition, I think it's page 27 of the Signet, the new one, uh, it, it's uh, the perception of power is as important as its possession. Now, Delante's never read Machiavelli, but he's imputing it, right? Is that a measurable skill? Don't know. Don't have a test for that. So I say, well, let me explain. I'm going to see someone named Cedric. Je Cedric Jennings? <laughs> That dude is insane. It's, it's explain. He's a geek. He's a nerd. He's a geek. He's a whitey. He travels these halls with no one. He's got, he's got no guys around him, he's, and he has words for that. I'm not going to get into all the slang. But to be alone in these halls is insane. Egghead, nerd, whitey, geek, fool. And you're talking to him. I said, that's I'm talking to him. I go up to chemistry. Cedric's there. If you've read A Hope in the Unseen, you'll see that's the moment where someone's copying Cedric's homework. And Cedric says, I didn't stay up half the night doing the homework for you to copy the damn homework. But in this exchange, noticed by the teacher, it's Cedric that gets put out. You see, Cedric is challenging an orthodoxy, a lay low orthodoxy. You know, every orthodoxy, almost by definition, creates heretics. Cedric is the heretic. It's the heretic who gets put out of the class. That's where Cedric sits, with the little beakers and the Bunsen burners. That's where he and I first talk. I say, hi, my name's Ron Suskai, and I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Uh-huh. And like, my editors are calling. I've been here a week and a half. I got nothing. I, I need you to help me. Huh. Help you. That's right. I, I need you to just let me um, see what you see, because I'm realizing that my knowingness, my omniscience, my certainty is misplaced. I don't have any that's really been earned. I have no idea what your life's like. And my job as a journalist to create cardboard cutouts and standing up opposing each other, beleaguered bureaucrat, it, bureaucrat inner city black male, CEO, line worker who's about to lose his job, that is not enough. Why? Because I'm getting taught by a left behind person who lives in my house, my son. And I'm like, I don't know anything. Teach me. Huh. I'm teaching you how, Cedric says. Just let me see the world through your eyes just for a day. And I'll have something that I've learned. I'll have something to write. He's like, okay, I got questions for you. I said, what? Where'd you go to college? I said, I went to University of Virginia. That's good. Virginia's good. Graduate school? Co Columbia. Columbia? You do any teaching? Don't some of you guys teach and do stuff like that? Yeah, I did, I've done some up. Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge? Oh, well, let's just get this clear. You taught at Harvard, and I'm teaching you what? This is clearly a scam. I'm not playing. He gets up, he walks out. I chase him down the hall. I'm a desperate man. I plead with him. I want to tell him this meritocracy that he's speaking to me about. It's not all he thinks. These gleaming 
brass emblems of the meritocracy. They may, they may reflect the light of learning, but they're not the light itself. But I can't explain that to him. It's too much, so I just plead with him. Now, mind you, he is parched with solitude at this point. He's got NFF, no friends. Do the middle F on your own. And he just says, let me just follow you around. He's like, well, I've got enough grief in this building without you. In case you notice, you haven't noticed, you're white. That's a problem for me. All right? I'll be even more of a target than I am. I said, all right, how about this? I'll just walk about 20 steps behind you, and no one will know we know each other. Okay, that might work. And then at night, I'll call you up, uh, and I'll listen, uh, though no one will know, and then you can explain to me what I've been seeing. Okay. So if I call you tonight at 11 o'clock, you'll talk to me? I might, I might not. I got a lot of homework. All right? I'm in charge. Fine. That's the beginning of our relationship. He was 16. A couple months later, he says, uh, we can't talk anymore. Unless you talk to my mother. I said, this could be a problem. Yes, it could. So what should I do? Well, I don't think there's much you can do. Now, Cedric's mother is a data input lady for the Department of Agriculture. Cedric's father's been in jail most of his life. You know, gun in the face stuff. Drug dealer, bank robber, hold up guy. For all of her life, it's really just been the two of them. She has two older children, but it's been her and Cedric, she and Cedric. So he says, oh, well, this might be our last conversation. I said, tonight, help me, what can I do? Well, you could bring dinner, it'd be nice. He said, where should I go? It's like, well, there's a place in Georgetown called Houston's. Uh, <laughs> you know what it is? Yeah. I said, uh, he said, Bishop Long at the church, he goes, he told, he said it was great in the sermon. So I, you go there and you get some of the good stuff. So I go to Houston's and I get about 20 pounds of pork ribs. All the fixings. I load it up in the back of my Volvo station wagon. And I drive across town. Can we get along? Can we find a way across these divides? I'm experimenting. I'm driving cross town in my Volvo with pork ribs in the way back. Reaching out. We sit and we eat the ribs. And I say to myself, how did we survive 3,000 years without these ribs? It's amazing to me. They're off, yeah, I just, I'm transported. It's a religious experience. And then afterward, um, there's just a big pile of bones. So she says, got to go do my homework. Bye. Just me and Barbara. She's looking across the pile of bones. Our shared moment is over. She says, uh, he's telling you things. I can't seem to stop him. So I'll tell you this once. I will not tell you twice. If you use anything he tells you to hurt him, I will kill you. After that, I drove home. My wife said, honey, how was work today? I said, good. A large African-American woman threatened to kill me. Other than that, fabulous day. It's the beginning of our relationship, me and Barbara. Tenth grade education. Testimony to that lovely rule that life is the only teacher you can trust without question. Those lessons are all keepers, and she has learned hard lessons in her life. Eventually, she teaches some to me. Eventually, she and Cedric and I drive in a van from Southeast to Brown University, as it being the only kid in a decade from his high school to make it to one of these places. The short twist of the story, well, it's the longest journey the two of them have ever been on. Washington, D.C. to Providence, about 512 miles. She had to be the father, the mother, the preacher, everything. She's a church lady now. She wasn't always. She 
had to be tough to get them here across this rutted terrain. All of a sudden, she's kind of willowy with reminiscence. It's not like her. Every mile she can feel going under the wheels. Because soon each of those miles will be a mile that separates them. Cedric, meanwhile, is crazy nervous. He's munching on sunflower seeds, a cheap snack. It's like there's seeds all over the car. It's like a, one of those harvester via, you know, like the, you know, they use in farms in Iowa. Every time we pass a rest stop, he's like, who's that? New Jersey Turnpike, the Molly Pitcher rest stop. I'm like, I think she was a nurse during one of the wars. Do I need to know her? No, you don't need to know her. The Vince Lombardi rest stop near the New York line. I'm like, he's the coach of the Packers. I didn't learn him. Don't worry about him. But the Eugene O'Neill rest stop near the Rhode Island border. I said, well, you may need to know him. Long journey's journey into night. Check that one out. Okay. Eugene O'Neill, playwright. Got it. Cedric has been living in an undernourished environment. Mostly independent study, like it is at many of the blighted schools still in America. Crowd control, just like the kids in Bosnia. Or these days, Kabul. We sing gospel as we get close to Brad. I'm in a very different place. When I was a kid, I thought if I went into a church, as a Jewish kid, my genes would be recombined. Someone would know I get a call from my rabbi. I see you've crossed over. <laughs> but now I'm singing gospel with the Jennings. The Jennings duo. And then we get to Brown. Next day. Mmm, oh, what a day. Sunny day. And at those, those years, Brown was $30,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a bargain, huh? That kind of money, they can hire the damn son. Cedric is a bullion. Suddenly, he's got the trunk up on his shoulder. He's saying hi to strangers. Hey, I made it. Individualism. Yes, I got it on my own. Yeah. We all feel it. No shame in it. I'm happy to see him bouncing along. And I turned to Barbara, I'm like, see, right, here it is, victory. She's like, uh-huh, something's wrong. Now, the old smug and certain Ron, rising to grab credentials, rising to win and measure high in the art stick of the meritocracy, the accepted version, I'd say, oh, that poor woman with her 10th grade education. She doesn't realize what a big deal this is to get her kid into Brown. I'd kill to get my kids in. Maybe I can teach her. That person is gone. Killed off by my son. When I see Barbara confused, I say, just bend in close and try to hear what she's saying. And just shut up. Shut the hell up and listen. 10th grade education. I've taught at Harvard. So I listen as best I can. What do I hear? Well, I hear what she hears. A little bit. All around us is a jaunty melody of generational succession. The parents pushing kids into the familiar. And saying, oh, I remember my first day too. <laughs> Terrific. You know, they say you can never go home again, but just remember, there's a safe seat up ahead next to mom and dad. And Thanksgiving will be wonderful. We're so proud of you. It's a song that I would hope to sing, certainly with my older son. Nothing wrong. It's a lovely song. But Barbara's not singing that song. She's singing a different one that's unfamiliar to my ear. A song of sacrifice and denial. And pushing her kid to a place she will never follow. 
And she's the only one singing it in my earshot. And after a few minutes, I hear her sort of not talking the way she usually talks. She's like, she's stymied because she's, well, she's fearful of her diction. I think she's hearing what parents are saying. She must be someone's maid. This is my crowd. And that's what someone is saying. I want to yell at them. I want to say, no, she's a brown parent just like you. She just sacrifices her whole damn life for it. And after a minute, she starts putting her hand over her dress because there's a spot on her dress. She just has one to wear, and she doesn't want them to see the stain on it. And it breaks my heart, is what it does, about us. It's a weird life, this life of observer and teller of stories that are other people's stories. Crazy life. You've got to step back. You've got to try to see it all and see it individually, and fit it together. And you all have been there, the opening day, that big giant drop-off day. One of the great days in America, right? Okay, you remember it. Probably like it was Tuesday. Okay? Because at 12 o'clock on opening day, right, the moms all do the same thing. Okay? What do they do? They make the bed. They all do it together. It's like a giant choreographed thing. There's 1,500 moms all making the bed at the same time. I asked a friend of mine, a Washington guy, he's a psychiatrist. He lives near us in northwest Washington. He's a British guy. I said, what's with the bed? What is going on there? Well, you know, it's the mother's way of protecting the child against the perils of college life. Sex. It's always about sex. I said, you know, Barbara makes this bed so tight. I mean, you can bounce a quarter and go right to the ceiling. I mean, you can't get in this bed. Let's just bring anyone with you into the bed. <laughs> she does a hospital corner. It's got like five folds. Well, she once was a domestic. She knows how to do this. Now, you don't need to consult a psychiatrist, though, to know why the moms spend 20 minutes making the bed. You remember your moms, right? Because it's the last thing they do, really, after a life of doing. Because after that, there's really nothing else to do. There's nothing else to do now. Cedric and Barbara start to weave toward the van, either wanting to leave, like, like they're not going anywhere, really, just walking. And then they get there to the bumper. And he turns toward her, and she opens her arms. He falls against her, and she whispers to him. She says, trust in God. Let him guide you, because I, I can't hear. And then she says what all the moms say. She says, you be good. I have no idea what that means. But didn't your mom say that? You be good. Be good. <laughs> yeah, my, my mom handled it a little differently. She got down in this kind of little Wolverine stance, you know. I mean, she's only five feet tall. So when she gets down, she's really going low. When she gets the finger, she but jabs me in the chest, I swear to God. What she says to me, she says, never look back, and shits me with a finger. Because someone will be gaining on me? What's it, like a Satchel Paige thing? I said, okay, I won't. Off she went. She wanted me to make sure I got there. Barbara and I drive back to Washington together. There's not a word exchanged until the GW Bridge. About three hours. 
Finally, she says, you know, I have no regrets or anything. Don't think that. I said, I'm not. Oh, fine. Let, let, let me explain to you. You see, I saw a lot of moms and no dads around and a lot of young boys, five, six, seven years old. They become the little man of the house. Next thing you know, she's 50 and he's 30. I told Cedric, I said, I have no needs you can do anything about. Your job is to leave me behind. Don't you ever forget it. He listened to his mother. We get to Washington and I fly back as quickly as I can. Got an apartment I've rented in Providence. So I'm going to be up there for the semester, first and second. Writing a book. It's a book I got to follow Cedric through his seminal first year at Brown University. I had my desk shipped up. I have a desk, you know, as a writer, you're very idiosyncratic. Like, you need things to be just right. So my desk is there, the little apartment. And in the drawer of the desk, all my stuff. Now, this day is one in which emotions are exploding in me. I'm a mess. And a mess is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's also painful and confusing to give up your knowingness, your omniscience. And about three in the morning, I keep thinking about today. What does it mean? And I'm just, I'm just procrastinating because I have nothing I, I can write. So I'm digging around in the back of the desk and way in the back in the corner, I find something. What the hell is this? And I pull it out and it's a picture. Now I have an aunt who's a librarian. She's like a saving archivist type. And she sent all the grandkids of my family a photo. And it's a photo of my great-grandfather on his first day in America. It's a copy of it. Okay, Comes here in 1892 from Russia or Poland, we're not sure. It depends on the year. What war was just won or lost. But he's here. He's 18 years old. Okay? And he knew it was going to be a big day. So he must have cobbled together whatever money he had, and clearly he had virtually no money to make sure he got a picture taken of him that big day. And here he is. He's standing there and he's got this little hat on. He's going, mm, like that. Because, you know, they didn't smile in 1892 for some reason. It was, I think, the teeth. Like, the bad teeth, right? He's looking right out. He's looking right at me. Then I realize he's looking beyond me, way beyond me, to this up ahead. I'm like, oh, there it is. This is the look I see in Cedric's eyes today. He's looking out, this place up ahead. My grandfather crosses an ocean on an ocean of up ahead. Cedric, almost the same thing, leaves the other America for this place that he thinks will be a promise, where he'll be judged on his merits, where he will be at home in his skin, where he will find his home. And that place is Providence. It's Brown. It's the same look. And all of a sudden I realize Cedric is closer to this man, this great-grandfather who is a hero in my family than I am. He's got the thing. The kernel. The kernel of what pushes us forward. This faith in possibility. We don't look alike. We don't talk alike. Cedric is anything but an immigrant. He and his family have been here in various ways for 400 years. But it's the, the stuff of the shared. I'm proud of everyone who got accepted to the University of Chicago. It's hard to do. It's 
hard to win those laurels. But I can tell you that if this works, this transaction you're in now, you are just beginning your learning. You are now in a place where you can reach across divides to find the person who seems least like you here and say, hi, yeah, um, you teach me and I'll teach you. I'll tell you what I see and you can tell me what you see. I am a believer from hard experience, much of it against my will, that in all the essential ways we are identical to one another. That the way things turn out on the ziggurat of the meritocracy is in many ways circumstantial and in most ways virtually meaningless as to the essential human worth. Doesn't mean people aren't proud of you. It doesn't mean you're not going to get that ticket punched by Goldman Sachs or wherever you want to go. But don't be deluded by it. My teacher, I'll bring you up to date, he's now 23. I travel the world all these years searching for the most left behind people I can find. Cedric Jennings. Mind you, Cedric ends up graduating from Brown. He's got a 910 SAT score combined, 400 points below the brand mean. He graduates four years later with a 3 4 average and a double major and gets a master's at Harvard. Which number you want to keep? You know, he had faith, will, adrenaline, self knowledge, born of ingenuity, born of survival. Those are muscles that get built walking into a strong headwind. They are the sweet uses of adversity. They are the way the human experiment actually works. When it's working, of course, what do I see now? It's like the Boston Marathon, where only the people in front get to stop at the water table. It won't work. It will be our undoing. So what does he learn? He learns the Western canon. They have that in books. Once he gets to Brown, he doesn't know who Sylvia Plath is. He doesn't know who Hemingway is. We're standing in the bookstore the first week of school. He sees the, the biography by Martin Gilbert of Winston Churchill. He's like, who is that? I should know him. I'm like, definitely you should know him. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister, England. Cramming. But those muscles, they kick in. He makes it. I travel the world writing about people who've been left behind. The most dramatically left behind person, based on the neurological hand he's been dealt, of course, is living in the bedroom. It's my son. The twist of it is that he teaches me. The end of that story is in the new book, Hope in the Unseen, 20 years ago, and Life Animated are like twins. My son finds a way. Cedric finds a way. I'll tell you one brief story of finding a way. It goes right to the heart of how the diversity conversation really works when it works. See, there's a, uh, it's my, uh, uh, is, is that pad here? Where's that? Um, my iPad with the, yeah. So at the key moment in his freshman year, Cedric is struggling. He has not built up many of the skills that he needs. If he had, and he had worked them, it would have reshaped him. What do we know now? What do I learn from my younger son? What do we know in the last 10 years that we didn't know then? So the brain is constantly reshaping itself. 
When I was young, we thought the map of the brain was meaningful. Frontal lobe this, left hemisphere that. Actually, the brain is very plastic. It's constantly reshaping. You're growing cells all the time. Certain learning reshapes you this way, other learning in another way. Cedric has not had any of the basic shaping that many of the suburban middleweight students at Brown have had. All right? So that's a bit of a crisis. He catches up, but at this point, it's a crisis. The hero of Southeast, the one in a decade to get into the Ivy League school, is hanging by a thread comes the spring of his first year. He goes to a school as part of an education seminar, middle level education seminar, level 300 or whatever. He's got to go to a school in Providence that ends up being much like the schools he's lived in. Mostly African-American kids, few kids Portuguese, Latino Americans. He sees them color-coded from the beginning based on expectations, based on luck of birth. A few kids move up, the rest, mostly people of color flow left. It outrages them. Now, the assignment is write a 10-page, double-spaced analysis of heterogeneous versus homogeneous grouping using this junior high school, bloodless, objective, step back, academic, with footnotes. He tries. Hmm. Every time he reads, he says, it's lame. It doesn't do justice to what he actually knows from experience. Knowledge he's earned in ways that the kids who are going from the country club to Andover to Yale don't know. So in crisis, the night before the papers do, he writes a 68-line epic poem. Now, I used to know it by heart, but, you know, I'm 54. I'm going to read a little bit of it. These kids, meaning the kids flowing off the abyss, these kids are brighter than the teachers think. Some can audit someone's taxes in just a blink. Instead, their minds are deteriorating with their kind, leaving educators in an ever-tightening bind. These kids are crying out for attention. The answer is not always found in detention. So will grouping them in sections solve the mystery? The answer may be obtained by looking at each kid's history. Their minds are eager. You can see. These kids are yearning for real diversity. But teachers are always telling them, no, you can't. So the kids end up fighting and darken their chance. They want to be challenged, but their brains slip into ease. Withholding their knowledge is like being a big tease. All this yields a lack of respect. Homogeneous grouping may be a prime suspect. I must admit I'm not pleased with this picture, nor the time it's taking for this painting to configure. But a true artist must possess patience, developing new ideas for his latest creations. Yes, red, yellow, and orange will do. But there's something still missing to create the perfect view. Always looking at the same hues is really no fun. Maybe I'll just let the colors run. This indeed is a great idea. This mixture will be named the picture of the year. With others, I won't conform to prove my expertise. My God, have I created a masterpiece? 68 lines of it. That's just a little bit at the end. Well, that is one brilliant poem. So now what do you do? The teacher. He's the one with the choice. His name's Larry Wakeford. 
No, he doesn't know much about Cedric. Cedric knows that this paper was not the assignment. Larry says, Cedric, would you uh, please come to my office after class? Cedric goes to the office. He's not actually breathing, but he goes. He's hanging by a thread. So Larry sits him down. He says, Cedric, I read your poem. It's brilliant, unmistakably brilliant. Not the assignment, not even close. You did not ask permission to write a 68-line epic poem, as far as I know. Now Cedric is almost ready to pass out because he knows it's going to come down hard. Now mind you, Cedric is a believer in the meritocracy. He's got a sweatshirt in his closet that he's had since junior high school that he would not wear for years, a Harvard sweatshirt. He wouldn't wear it because he felt he had not earned the right to wear it. And it's about to come down hard. Larry says, uh, all right, let me level with you here. You got lucky that I'm your teacher. You see, Larry's not a Brown professor. Larry's on one of these Theodore Sizer, he's an educational guru, fellowships at Brown. He's the vice principal of an, of an inner city magnet school in Cincinnati. White guy, but lives in a tough terrain. He's got a school full of kids like Cedric. He's like, uh, so I kind of know who you are, all right? So, um, Look, you can't give up your anger or your acquired knowledge from your experiences. It is a thing of great value. But you're going to have to try to step back from your anger, though rightfully won that anger, and try to see it a little bit the way other people might. And I can help you with that. We can do some one-on-ones here for the next couple weeks. Because I'm going to give you a B-minus on this whatever this is. But you got to kick it and hit it in the final paper of the class, or there's nothing I can do for you. I can help you see the way we render more broadly and in these adopted and acceptable ways educational essence. We good? He's like, okay. And they spend time together one-on-one. And Cedric does manage it on that final paper which is why he graduates three years later with the 3-4 average and goes on to get his master's in education at Harvard and another master's from Michigan in social work, and which is why he's now the Youth Advisory Commission Chairman of the District of Columbia, cabinet post. Larry Wakeford had the choice. Cedric was hanging by a thread and Larry had the scissors. And he put them aside. He knows what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to hold up that yardstick of the meritocracy and say, uh, mm-mm, mm-hmm. But he knows from experience, which is what diversity is about, have people of widely varying experiences come together because that's a teacher you can trust without question and they will learn from each other. Larry has learned from the kids at his school in Cincinnati. So he has a wider perch of wisdom to say the yardstick of the meritocracy is bent, self-referential, drawn and constructed, mostly by people it is already rewarded. That's the truth. It's always that way. And I'll tell you, this yardstick gets tough to throw away when you gold plate it. And Larry knows that, so he makes this choice. And everyone's better off. And once Cedric reads the Western Canon, which is in books, by second and third year, with the experience he has, the real stuff. He stands in the class, and he holds forth 
finding in the experiences rendered in books, experiences that match his life, and the kids who have lived a narrow existence, cushioned, see some things that they might not otherwise see. And they're better for it. That's, those are my kids, my son, my older son. That's what it's about. Trusting what's worth trusting, doubting what's worth doubting, seeing it clearly, and refuting that old, painful, biblical passage that we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. That's not an immutable truth. That's a challenge. So now, in America, I'll just finish by saying that Cedric has company. Because his partner, my silent son, well, he talks now. Cedric uses what he has. He's got to find a way. So he writes his 68-line epic poem. Brilliant. My son, silent, autistic, memorizes 20 Disney animated movies in his silence, rewinding, as sound alone. You get autism, your auditory processing goes haywire. Can't understand speech. Can't understand us. He can talk about it now. He described it to us about two, three years ago. Yeah, after we moved to Washington, I couldn't understand anything you or mom said. It was all gibberish. I said, Cornelia, my wife said, was that scary? He said, it was worrisome and weird. So he memorized the movies as sound alone. Like memorizing a Kurosawa movie when you don't know Japanese. Laying down the track. 20 of them. All the ones you know. Dumbo, Peter Pan, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King. Eventually we realized that uh, he had laid them down nice and neat. So if you threw a line at him, he'd throw you back the next line. If I said, you'd make one great bear, that would be Baloo from Jungle Book. You'd say, ah, oh, Papa Bear. You think so? There's Mowgli. Does he understand what Mowgli's saying? We didn't know. So we became animated characters in our house. We played out all the scenes of Disney. My older son, my wife, that's what we did. During the day, I'm wrestling with presidents. At night, I'm meditating on good and evil with Owen in the voices of Scar, Jafar, Maleficent. Dick Cheney, he basically felt Jafar works best. He creates an emotional language out of scripts. He has a measurable IQ of 75. Oh boy, trouble. It's a cousin of Cedric's 910 on the SATs. Circumstantially, and in many ways, such things are well beyond our capacity to measure. I know the people who make the tests. I have a cousin who was the Stanford Binet guru at Harcourt Brace for years. He used to try tests out when I was when we were kids. It'll take a thousand years before we can measure anything as ethereal as human possibility, intelligence, innovation. It's like catching sunlight in mason jars. Owen is a 75 IQ. That means people say, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good. 75, oh, that's a shame. Okay, uh, this is a mop. You know what a mop is? Okay, so just that whole area over there. Uh, forever. We good? Be happy. Well, now he's written a script that Disney is ready to buy. He found a way. The brain finds a way. 
pathway gets blocked. Could be by the neurological hand Owen is dealt in some ways. Could be by the cultural hand, the hand of poverty that Cedric has dealt. See, Cedric doesn't have a neurological issue. But the fact is, is that what we call neurotypical, you, me, whatever, I don't know what that means. We're all neurologically distinct and constantly reshaping ourselves. It's the in-group and the out-group, just what we always do. So now the two of them walk astride as characters in these two books that are twinned in the minds of lots of readers. This is what diversity is about. It's about us embracing our best selves, embracing humility, which is really the seedbed of real learning, saying, I can be taught often by the unbooked. I want to meet people who are so different from me, I barely can speak their language. And what will happen is eventually we'll find the thing that's shared, that works. It's not just a buzzword. It's not just a PC word. And if anybody thinks they're cool, by being non-PC or edgy or saying something that offends somebody, they are blind to what is actually cool historically. The people who cross divides who win history's game. Always. I'll just finish by saying that my two characters, Cedric and Owen, I talk to them, of course, Cedric, every couple weeks, Owen, every few hours. Send their regards. Owen, um, and I do dialogue together. That's how we learn to talk, after all. And one of his favorites is Merlin to Arthur, Sword in the Stone. Anyone see that one? It's a good one, isn't it? Knowledge and wisdom is the real power, my boy. He says it all the time. He says there's something deeper than that. We're out now on book tour. It's a big crowd of people. Owen now stands with me in front of a crowd. First big crowd. Looked out across this gang. Big crowd. I said, what do you want to say to me? He says, I don't know. Let's do a voice. I said, okay, which one? Let's do Merlin and Arthur. I said, which Merlin and Arthur? Oh, let's do love business. Okay. So there he is. Now, mind you, this is a young person who is deemed to be without human value by many people through his life. Can't express emotions, so don't, don't have it. Well, what do you do with them? Do you put them in some sort of institution? How, how does that work? He found a voice. So we do love business. Sword in the stone. Arthur and Merlin. He does Merlin because he knows all the lines. He knows, oh, 100 hours of lines. All the dialogue. I get the one line from Arthur because that's more my speed. So to this big crowd of people, he says, well, this love business, boy, it's a powerful thing. And Arthur says, greater than gravity? Well, yes, boy. I think it's the most powerful force on earth. And Owen says, I feel love because I can stand in front of you as one of you. That's all he wants, just to be part of the main, just to be in the mix. Just like his buddy Cedric. So, thank you for letting me tell the stories of these two friends. Okay, let's do some questions. I, look, I've got nothing else to do tonight, so let's do some questions. And then I'll sign books. Uh, we can go as late as you want. Yes? What happened to Barbara? I love you asking that. Okay, Barbara 
is a key actor here in the diversity conversation because she is one is, that is often in the discard pile, right? And, and Barbara and I become friends, but it takes a while. And, uh, and actually, she becomes friends, she tells later, we did a big day at the U.S. government. It was a thing where she got on a stage. She doesn't, she's, she's not shy, she's just private. But we got on a stage together, and someone asked how you learn to trust this white guy, is the question. It was, it was, take your secretary to work day at the federal government. It's a couple years ago. So it was mostly white bosses and African-American staff. This big thing at the Mayflower Hotel. So one of the women asked Barbara this. And I was interested in the answer myself. She says, well, um, actually, a couple years after we met, me and Ron, um, I was cooking uh, with his wife. I went over to their house for the first time, and Cornelia and I were cooking, and we just, we just cooked that day, and, it, you know, I felt like I'd known her my whole life, and we just shared everything. And, and she's lovely, you know. And I said, well, if she sees something in him, well, maybe something's there. <laughs> so there you got it. Race, gender, I don't know, class? That's, what, that's what's what clicks it. They shared as women. And that was the, the bridge. Now, Barbara <laughs> then was asked a question by one of the women. It was a tough question. This day was quite a day. And she raised her hand, one of the ladies, and she says, I live in the part of town where you live in, and my son just saw a terrible thing on the street. Someone got shot. It was about three weeks ago, and he shut down. I cannot eat that. will not talk to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. He's, he's 11. It's a tough time. What should I do? And Barbara says, oh boy. Um, well, she says, you know, you're going to want to tell him everything he should know. But you can't say anything. Just be there close to him. Just try to listen. Just be ready to listen. Just show him love. And hopefully that love will will be something he bends to and he'll start to talk to you. That's what I would do. Tenth grade, education. A barber passed away in January. Uh, 69. Not, not very old. Uh, heart issues. And, um, but I went down with my older son, Walter, to Scripture Cathedral, which is the church in the book, Hope and the Unseen. And it was, a, it was a forbidding morning. I flew down from Boston, and Walt lives in Washington, my older son. And we went to the church. And uh, it was about eight degrees out, Saturday morning. And a thousand people showed up. Mm. Data input lady, Department of Agriculture, discounted by the brilliant economy, efficient in identifying human value and rewarding it appropriately. A thousand people. She lived a life of service and of giving. Saw people as they are, no matter where they ended up in this brilliant meritocracy of ours. And a thousand people showed up. And everybody spoke. I think my father would say, worthwhile life. Big turnout. Question? You inspire me. Thank you. I should be preaching as a Jewish guy, but I don't know. Something changed when I went to Scripture Cathedral. Oh, so I won't ask you. I'll ask maybe if uh, Owen yep. asked his wife. Yep. Um, what advice would you give him to go into the
Yeah, yeah, and the notion that I've worked hard and have something to show for it is a sign of my goodness. I mean, this is an old ethic, and it's hard and anything wrong to dismiss it, you know? We have something in our brain. I sit around with neuroscientists these days because they're interested in how Owen has embraced his affinity, in this case Disney, and how many kids on the autism spectrum and many untraditional learners find a passion an affinity, and they express their capabilities through the affinity. They don't manage well in the one-size-fits-all model of education, mostly a warehouse model developed in the late 1800s. It's got a lot of bodies to move. Nowadays, educational gurus I know say, you know, everyone should have an individualized educational plan now. We have the horsepower for it. But we do one-size-fits-all. Why? Because we have one nice comparative standardized measurements to say you win today's game of musical chairs and I'm sorry you can go now. Punch your ticket, move up. Okay. Now interestingly this gets mucked up when you start thinking of these compensatory strengths. Now Owen has compensatory strengths. Pathways block it's just conservation of energy, entropy. Remember you learned that in high school. It goes somewhere. It might be nicely evenly distributed or it might be a little out of whack. Some of the most talented people in America are a little out of whack. If they could just make it through the one-size-fits-all model of schooling, well, God bless them. They often are celebrated for that compensatory muscle. Now, it's fabulous that many of the people here could manage the distributed and generalized model of education. That's good, too. But many of the folks with these compensatory muscles are in the discard pile. Cedric, in his way. Owen, certainly. Example, easy, a month ago. Owen using the Disney movies to create his own language, now is prized by people. Most discarded and left behind person I know. So we go to the opening of Aladdin on Broadway. Okay? Big giant $50 million extravaganza, just like The Lion King. Okay? And Owen and all of us have been in the New York Times on March the 9th. Big excerpt of Life Animated, the book, and a video made by a guy named Roger Williams, documentary filmmaker, Academy Award winner, four-minute video of Owen doing voices in a very brilliant and interpretive way. We go to the show. Okay. We get it at the end. An open, if anyone ever been to an opening of a Broadway show? This is our first time. It's a big extravaganza. You know, everyone's fabulous, and they're all looking at each other, and, you know, and, you know, lots of artistic, you know, celebrated types. And, of course, all of Disney's there, too, from the West Coast, the whole... Someone spots Owen back in row R, because he's been in the story in the Times. All of a sudden, I see the entire management team of the Walt Disney Corporation marching up the aisle to row R, led by Bob Iger. He's the CEO. Owen, Owen, thank you. Thank you for teaching us things we couldn't see. You know, Owen is happy, but he's not all that impressed with the suits. He's more interested in the creative people, the animators, people who write the music. So the big moment of the night happens when, at the after party, he meets a guy named Alan Menken. Anyone know who he is? He's the guy who writes all the music. Several Academy Awards. Owen has been singing these songs even before he knew what the words meant. A solace, comfort. Eventually, he turns it into language. He says to Mencken, Alan Mencken, you're my hero. And Mencken knows who Owen is at this point. And he says, oh, I used your songs as, uh, I, saw, I used to sing a whole new world every morning. 
because I realized the world would be new to me every day. Your songs were a lifeboat to me. And of course, Mencken's bawling. And then they're hugging. And after a little while, Mencken goes, oh, and I, can I tell you something? I mean, I don't tell people this. But I'm, I'm learning disabled. I was the kid in the back of the class. You know, hanging by a thread. I, I mean, that's why I would make up songs in my head, little notes. The teacher took me aside at some point and says, you're a little different, aren't you? Okay, come over here. For every thousand people like that, hundred people like that, you get one who is Alan Menken. What about the other 99? Some of them are pushing brooms right now singing songs in their head. People are starting to get this. They're realizing much of what's rewarded is actually a very narrow span from here to here. And in terms of all the enlightened self-interest of us, civilizations either rise or fall, prosper or vanish throughout history based on how they tap, identify, release, and express human capacity. The ones who do it well, they win the laurels. Sometimes they do it well, and then they lock in, and they don't do it so well. They protect. I got mine. And they end up in history's dustbin. People get this. They know this in their guts, even if they're fearful that they'll lose the musical chairs game. When I go over to ABC, I have to do a thing on NBC, and I see Brian Williams in the hall. I do like a Chris Matthews thing about the CIA's report on the Senate report. And he's like, I read the thing in the Times, I read it. This is, this is it, this is a giant thing. You're talking about unleashing human potential that we discard for all these wrong self-referential reasons, protective reasons. This is what takes us to Mars. Enlightened self-interest. It's all that works, ever. We are now in a place where diversity, if it is reframed right, will find companion words of opportunity and, frankly, survival. One more question. Okay, I'm just going to finish then, and we're going to go eat. This is, so like everyone can come to dinner, the whole This is like one of those things, you ever hear like where Steve Martin would do the routine where he'd go to the McDonald's with like, uh, he'd take like 500 people from a nightclub and they'd all go together. You know, I want 500 Big Macs. <laughs> we'll all go to the restaurant. Um, I'm going to tell you a very, very short finish, which I think hits it right in the head. So at the end of Life Animated, um, which is doing fine now, I was on Jon Stewart um, on Tuesday. John gets this. He, he does a thing called Night of Too Many Stars, which is a big, giant autism fundraiser. Robert Smigel, I don't know if you know, some of you may know, he's kind of the longtime Saturday Night Live guru, writer, buddy, guy. He runs it. He's got a, a kid on the spectrum like we do. So I'm on Stewart, and it's, there's joy and love. And so the book is selling. But afterwards, Stewart and I were talking about the end of the book. The end of the book, Owen himself writes a story. It's his story. Okay? It's a short story. And he animates it too. He draws pictures. They're just like an animator. It's a beautiful story. Owen, when he gets thrown out of a school as uneducable at 11 years old, 
uh, goes to the basement where we play out the Disney movies, where he kind of learns to, to speak, and he also learns to read by reading credits. This is his underground lair. Now, he's bruised by being thrown out of the school. It's mostly for learning disabled kids. The autistic spectrum kids too hard to teach. But he really can't tell us how he feels because he can't speak well enough to do that. So he goes to the basement. After a couple months, we realize something has happened, that he has become an aficionado of the sidekicks. And when we press him, he explains in a kind of routinized way that the sidekick helps the hero fulfill his destiny. That's what a sidekick does. There are hundreds of them in Disney. Some are goofy, some are confused, some are resourceful, some are wise. Merlin, Merlin's one. Jiminy Cricket, Timothy the Mouse. Joseph Campbell loved these people. You know, of course, Disney is just like the Brothers Grimm. They took the folklore of humanity, stories we've been telling ourselves for thousands of years to make our way in the world. Sidekicks are crucial. But Owen, at this point, sees the wider world. He realizes that kids are racing forward and he is caught in the starting blocks. We hoped he wouldn't see the world or understand where he fit. Cornelia and I, but now we realize he does. So he becomes an expert in these sidekicks, feeling himself like a sidekick. And he draws furiously at this point, drawing which may be a career for him someday. But I pick up the first sketchbook, and it's got a hundred sidekicks, no heroes. And at the end, he's written two things. One, I am the protector, P-R-O-T-E-K-T-E-R, -E -E of the sidekicks. And the last thing he writes is, no sidekick gets left behind. And scrawl. Now, two hops to present. Eventually his brother. His brother in the cards for birthdays. I'm drawn as a sidekick. I'm Merlin. My wife is Big Mama from Fox and the Hound. You know that character? It's Pearl Bailey. Okay, she's the wisest and gentlest of the women sidekicks. O only one drawn as a hero is his brother, his older brother. He's always drawn as a hero. Everyone else is a sidekick. His brother is always there for him. So his brother challenges him. Owen wants traditional hand-drawn animation to come back. His brother's like, oh, and they're doing the computer animated things like they do two a week. It's easier. No one cares about it like you do. Owen draws. He wants the hand drawn. He thinks it's got more soul. The characters are, have, have heartbeats. So he's like, look, if you want hand drawn to come back, you've got to step up, buddy. You've got to lead the charge. No one ever challenges Owen because we want it to be easy for him. It's easy as we can make it. But his brother says, what do you got? Got any movies in there? Ideas? Something? Been watching them since you're a little peanut. And he's like, Well, I have one. We all get quiet. The little windows open. And he says, Okay, okay. Uh, 12 sidekicks searching for a hero. <sighs> and in their journey and in the obstacles they face, each finds the hero within themselves. Well, that's his movie that Bob Iger says, wow, how did he do that? That inverts our equation. You know, we identify the hero in the third scene when they sing the I Wish song. Now he wants the hero to emerge dynamically from sidekicks who are searching for a hero. That's kind of America, kind of, right? Yeah. Interesting, though. The finish of the story is these 12 sidekicks, including Owen, He's got an avatar called Timothy, which is him. They search for transformation because they're villains in the forest, real villains, evil. And they will have to face them without heroes. What they do is try to find the qualities of hero within each other. And a twist in the plot. <laughs> they try to find their creators, the animators, so they can be redrawn as heroes, because that's what they'll need. 
doesn't work out. Because his philosophy, which is my philosophy, learned from him, is that we are all sidekicks who help someone else fulfill their destiny when we're at our best, searching for this inner hero. And when we find it, it is a good day. And that's what's real. You don't need me to tell you, just because I've interviewed presidents and CEOs and all the rest, the minute they say, okay, are ready to be drawn as hero. Okay. It's the minute they go down, they start the decline. What I love about this is this idea that heroism is a choice. It is our choice every day. We sidekicks, ever sidekicks. We don't change, we don't get redrawn, but we can find and summon this inner hero. And it is our choice today, like every day, which is why it's so much fun to hang out with all of you. So thanks, and let's go get some food. <laughs>